This is the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Kendall of the notaballerina.com travel blog. Every episode, I'll share travel tales from several fellow travel lovers, and together we hope to entertain and inspire you, remind you of some of your own great travel experiences, and encourage you to hit the road again soon. Hello and welcome to episode 316 of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. It's on fathers talking about travelling with kids. Mostly their kids, sometimes their grandkids, sometimes kids on tours that they organise. But the one thing in common is these are all dads and it was really lovely to gather together a bunch of their thoughts about what travelling does for kids. Spoiler alert, it's all positive. Uh, Before I begin, I'd like to pay my respects to the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, where I'm recording this podcast. Now, my own experience traveling with my dad, there's been a lot of them over the years. Obviously, long-time listeners will know that as a kid, I was very lucky to be a camper van around Europe and Australia, and uh, my dad was doing the majority of that driving, and we had lots of funny moments, lots of things we still talk about today. And... My other favorite trip with my dad was when I was living in Japan and he and his wife came over to visit me and I'd already visited um, a little fishing village down near Isu um, and I'd imagined my dad being there. He uh, loves um, loves to do a bit of fishing. And uh, I managed to take them down there. Or actually, I remember distinctly, I met them down there. They were traveling in the area and I fell asleep on the train and uh, was only woken at the last second to get off in the right spot. So I was like, oh, phew. So I made it there and I've got, uh, yeah, very fond memories of showing my dad all this, uh, the seaweed farming that was going on down there, which might sound odd, but it was of great interest to both of us. So anyway, lots and lots of good stories I can think of on when I think of traveling with my father. And so I'm, yeah, really keen to put this episode together and I've got some fabulous, fabulous guests. Now, my first guest is Rupert Gray, who is a fascinating UK guy. Uh, He is a lawyer in the libel space, but is also a massive adventurer. And I asked him about uh, what happened when he took his family to Bangladesh in the early 90s. We arrived in Bangladesh in uh, July 1992, and it was the end of a a six-month journey with our three daughters who were then aged five, eight, and 11. And uh, we only went to Bangladesh because of some friends of ours were there um, and said it would be um, nice to see us on the way home. We were on our way back from Australia. And we arrived at the airport uh, with one quite sick child. Mm. And uh, the first sort of intimation of what Bangladesh was like was the sign of the exit to the airport doors, which said, uh, welcome to Bangladesh before the tourists get there. And we were the only people, white people, off the plane. Interesting. And outside the airport, there were rank upon rank of of, uh, the poor of Bangladesh, uh, hoping that uh, people like us would appear and was backsheesh Mm. and so on. So that was quite a um, a, a very dense crowds. And that was quite an introduction for the children. Mm. And within a week, we were down in the Sundarbans, which is the the largest mangrove forest in the world, uh, down by the Bay of Bengal. And very wild then and pretty wild still now. In the sense that there's no communications, there's no roads, there's no electricity, there's um, uh, a way of life goes on very much as it's gone on for, for centuries. Mm. And we were traveling with, um, with our friends and a sort of pirate king who is the leader of the freedom fighters in the 1971 war, which is what gave birth to Bangladesh. Mm. And uh, he was standing for parliament and this was his election campaign, which was by boat. Fascinating. Uh, and we had three other children of our friends. So we were six children the pirate king, uh, half a dozen gunmen, and uh, uh, the back of the boat was this um, photographer, Bangladesh photographer, called Shaidul Alam. After learning about this quite unusual trip to Bangladesh with his three daughters, I asked Rupert about how his daughters had coped with this trip. I mean, looking back, they, they were extraordinarily adaptable mm. uh, because the physical circumstances of living in places like the Sundarbans are not what most children are used to, or indeed most grown-ups. Uh, it was very hot. The monsoons were spectacular. The mosquitoes were spectacular. <laughs> and uh, it was a way of life that they'd never seen anything like. And we travelled in quite a lot of uh, unlikely places, but there was nothing really that prepared them for what Bangladesh um, had, had to offer, not least in terms of poverty, not so much in the Sundarbans, but uh, in, in Dhaka. Mm-hmm. One of the things I remember best was how they dealt with 
with beggars. Mm. Uh, Bangladesh is known for its poverty, or at least it was then, and less so now. Most grown-ups sort of shy away. They don't quite know how to deal with it. Mm. The children basically said, we want some money, and we will decide who has priority. <laughs> so a, a beggar who had no arms would get a bigger a bit of cash than a beggar with one arm or two arms. <laughs> and they just faced that sort of reality um, on the basis that this is what they could do, and they couldn't do anything more than that. Uh, but what they were going to do was to do, and they were going to do it properly. Mm. Uh, and it was quite a sort of lesson in, in how to respond to people in such a, a, a different situation in a very pragmatic way, uh, rather than in the way that adults tend to, which is sort of shy away thinking, how can we deal with this? We need to mm. um, uh, change society. The children just looked at the person and said, what can we do for them? Mm. That was quite enlightening as an adult. We kind of didn't leave them to it, but we allowed them to take the lead. But they, they still talk about the time in, in Bangladesh. It's, uh, it made a deep impression on them. Not, not just that, but the whole the river way of life. We spent a lot of time on the rivers, right. um, stopping at communities and... While the king made his speech, his election speeches, and Shahidul translated for us, and, and we ate incredibly hot curries on very hot decks, talked to the king about his life. He was really a pirate, actually, a self star king. And he told stories about his time in the war. It was completely, it was like a sort of, uh, almost a boy's own story, really. <laughs> That's incredible. So you say they still talk about it. Do you think that travelling at those young ages impacted, you know, their personalities or how they grew up or their outlook on the world? Yes, I, I would find it difficult to describe, but I, I, th I think the best way of conveying that was um, one of them, who is now a, a professor of uh, theology and philosophy at Durham, gave a lecture at the Royal Geographical Society, which I've been involved with for donkey's years, uh, a year and a half ago, I suppose. And the topic of the lecture was uh, the relevance of theology and philosophy to how we deal with climate change and uh, to what extent it can provide a framework through which we can uh, a, a understand climate change and B, do something about it. And it was quite a big audience. And she started off by showing pictures of her in Bangladesh, my black and whites, uh, just a, two or three, three or four of them. Yeah. Um, uh, and in particular, one of her in the jungles of Borneo at the age of two. Wow. Uh, with the devastation of the rainforest mm. all around. Um, and this little child's coming down a, a muddy track towards the camera. And she said something like, it was moments like that that made me see the, the, the world of the environment as the most important uh, thing that, could, uh, that would be in my life. Uh, and it's those experiences that have guided me towards the position I am now in to talk about the environment in, in a way that matters and in a way that persuades. Hmm. Wow. And that was a very powerful, very powerful moment, and a, a powerful testament to the value you can bring to a young child's life without actually being able to measure or recognize it at the time, or for that matter, later. Uh, I, I completely agree. I, um, I have a 13-year-old and he's always traveled a lot with me. And I mean, I often say I wish I had two 13-year-olds and one had stayed home and one had come with me and I could compare them because, like you say, it's very hard to kind of elucidate an actual, you know, you can't be sure. But I feel like his personality has definitely been influenced by having a greater worldview and that greater range of experiences. No matter, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, you, you can never measure it. You just get a sixth sense mm -hmm. uh, that they're seeing the world in a perhaps just a, a slightly different light. Mm -hmm. But we, we've got that very strongly from all of them. I mean, I mentioned the one, but the others too. Um, uh, 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 it, it had an influence, and they still they still talk about it. I'm not surprised they still talk about. It. Here I am in my mid forties, still talking about trips I took with my dad when I was nine. So I think these things do leave a very very lasting impression. Now, my next guest is Christian Martinus. Uh, you may remember him from last week's episode. He runs tours in Morocco. And I asked him about uh, some of the children who join his tours in Morocco. And he then goes on to give a delightful example of a travel experience he had with his own daughter. And what, what happens with, with a lot of, uh, for example, with a lot of families that come and visit Morocco, and especially the people that can afford to travel to Morocco with, you know, taking a private tour and all that is not everybody. When they go in these locations and they meet local people, their lives are much more simple or, or let's say, uh, minimalistic in that sense. And then most of the times it's, it's the children, but sometimes also the adults that realize of how much they have and how much they can be uh, grateful for. Uh, because those families and those people that they meet, they are content Maybe not happy is not the right word, but content and at peace with, with what they have and life as it is, you know. Mm. And I think that's another another big, big, uh, big thing to take back home with you. 100%. I always remember my son met a bunch of kids in Cambodia 
who were playing soccer and they were playing soccer on something that you couldn't be you couldn't call it a field it was a kind of a slightly empty area of land that was very like not flat and um you know you got spikes from the weeds and all sorts of things and the kids had made goals from tree branches um but they were having a blast he got to play with them it was equally as much fun as playing soccer back home and you know for them it was just as much fun and i think that was uh, he was maybe 8 7 or 8 years old at the time and i think it was like oh you know you could see his little brain thinking huh yeah this is fine too so we don't need this perfectly groomed soccer pitch to have fun yeah no for sure mm. for sure <laughs> i mean i uh some of my best some of my best memories traveling with my with my daughter uh across morocco is is like that it's uh just being in the middle of nature things that happen we had a flat tire we had to sleep in the middle of nowhere oh wow in a tent and we uh, you know and we 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 had one of the most beautiful starry sky we ever we ever seen mm. and you probably have talked about that many times since i did because i i tell her that you know now she's she's 12 so uh, she got to the age, that age where whereas just a year ago was let's do a lot of things together to let's not do anything together <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> I know that well. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I remind her of, of that. Ex- I remind her of that experience because uh, I think it was I don't know three or four in the morning. She she woke up all by herself. She went to the tent, opened it, and said, "Dad, come and see." And she said, oh. "Wow, look at those stars!" I was yeah. I couldn't say anything. You know, there's, there was no worse for it. That's <laughs> so beautiful. Wow. Yeah, I think our kids are very lucky to be mm. able to have those kind of travel experiences in those formative years. I think it changes them in a in a good way. Of course, I mean, especially especially uh, Morocco. You have uh, first of all, you have the climate which allows you to travel all year round. You have the temperature for it, and then you have locations and. Uh, ways of life that actually, you know, uh, put everything else into perspective. You have still nomad people, nomad people where they they don't have actually, you know, nothing stable to say, to call a house or an adobe or anything like that. And interacting with them occasionally puts everything else into, into perspective, you know. Mm, so <laughs> true. Yeah, for us and for kids, yeah. That image of your daughter opening the tent and seeing the stars is just, that's such a delightful idea. Yeah, no, I was, I was uh, shocked because it, would, it had been a really, really difficult uh, evening. You know, we punctured a tire. It was a, it was a huge Toyota. I had no idea how to change the tire because it's not like on a normal car. Uh, I had no network connection. We were in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, I had one of uh, local guides, Hassan. Uh, God bless him. And he, uh, he, we had to walk like 12 kilometers to get, to get a phone reception to call somebody to tell us how to change the tire. Oh, no. By the time we got back, it was already 11 o'clock in the evening. So we said, okay, well, we set camp here, made a fire. We ate some, some cans of something and, uh, we, we slept in the tent, but it was, yeah, it was great. Next day we, next day we went for, next day we went for lunch with, uh, with the nomads. There was oh. a, a family of nomads that had set camp not far from there. That they sacrificed a little sheep for us, oh, and wow. uh, we had a lunch and lunch and Moroccan tea under the tent. Oh, beautiful! That's another very special experience, and I do love that. Even though things went wrong, it still became a memorable experience, both for Christian and his daughter. I'm always saying the things going wrong, they generally make the best stories that we remember the most and uh, and get lots out of. Now, my next guest today is Peter Baines of Hands Across the Water. You might remember him from episode 312 when he spoke with me about the fundraising cycling trips he runs across Thailand. So I asked him in that conversation as well if he had ever taken his kids on any of the rides. And I was only talking to my daughter. She she wrote to me while I was on the ride and she said, where are you in the world, Dad? You know, um, know, checking in. I said, oh, I'm doing a bike ride. And I said, you know, funny, I was just thinking about... You know, this day back in 2011, where we're right, you and I were riding here, and you got a flat tire, and and uh, and we're just uh, and, you know reminiscing. And she said, "Oh, you know, there's such um, strong memories." And, mm. and and I talk about the things that you do with your kids. Um, like for me and my dad, like he annoyed the shit out of me on the ride. Don't worry about that. But parents are supposed done, to, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, he does a good job. But, you know what he'd done was he. We were banking memories, yes. And he's now in his uh, mid eighties, and certainly his riding days are over. But um, you know, that's something that 
no one can ever take away from me the experience I had with my dad, I had with my kids, mm. I had with my wife. And, you know, on this ride just gone, we had a father and son. The son was 18, so that gives you, you know, I guess the dad was around that mid-40s or so forth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and again, like I just loved watching them have that experience together and, and I kept reminding um, Brinny, the, 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 the young fella, I said, you know, you don't probably appreciate just how special this is to do something like this with one of your parents and and because you know the kids could then get to the age where you know going on holidays with mum and dad no longer is too cool and or, or no longer is cool they're too cool yeah. and uh, and and um, then you know and once they start work and then get partners you know asking them to take two weeks off that well you're funding it if you want them to come and mm-hmm. and then you know when we did that high low grateful session you know, watching uh, Brinny and Anton, you know, father and son speak of their, their highlight and the highlight was uh, that they got to share it together and, you know, this public sh- show of emotion from an 18-year-old boy amongst 20 people he hadn't met until a few days ago, it was a gift. And I talk about these rides as being food for the soul mm-hmm. and, uh, and they absolutely are. It's especially beautiful to hear about those moments, those really, really meaningful travel moments with teenagers, especially, I think, teenage boys and their dads who, well, certainly in our culture, are often not so good at having those heart-to-heart kind of chats. So I love that. Now, my final guest today is Rick Antonson. And rather than fathers, this example is about grandfathers. Uh, The same principles apply. Um, And obviously, (laughs) Rick is a father because otherwise he couldn't be a grandfather. But in this case, he mentions travel with his grandson, Riley, when he was 10. And this is a story that takes place in Canada. And part of the trip was a trip on the Rocky Mountaineer, that amazing train route that I would love to travel someday. This was with my grandson, Riley, and he was 10 years old. And we spent a couple of weeks, first of all, in the Rocky Mountains around Banff, then two days going to Vancouver, overnighting in Kamloops along the way. Then we're in Vancouver for a piece. Then we're for another few days back on to Whistler overnight and then to, to Quinnell and then to Jasper and back in the Rockies. It just, it was, it was stunning. And I, I write about, you know, how train travel is an ongoing conversation and, and you're getting all of the things that are drawing you on and teasing you on because you know that the next hour is not going to be like hour you just are training through. And that, that's, that's neat. But being with, a set of eyes that are one seventh the age of mine <laughs> and a mind that is just trying to learn things brought a, uh, a really nice magic to it. Mm. So I've become a, a somewhat of an apostle for what is intergenerational travel. And I know it's kind of been around, but I've talked to some people because I come out of the, the, the destination marketing role. I, I at one point was president and CEO of, of tourism Vancouver, now called destination Vancouver. So, you know, my job was to invite people to come to a destination, but I've never concentrated on a market segment known as intergenerational travel. My guess is that's been an oversight. I, you know, you're in a coach on the Rocky Mountaineer where the, the upper magnificent part is like 72 passengers below is a, a restaurant where the food is the best view dining you'll get anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the, the view is extraordinary, but out back, there's a say three meter by three meter observation deck. And we'd be out there. And a, a, a lot of those in our coach were from Australia, but there were people from Japan, people from, uh, from Spain, people from America, people from all over. I mean, it was like the United Nations and a train coach. It was, it was wonderful. Most of them, given the demographics, were probably grandparents. Mm-hmm. And they, they often offered to take Riley over. They mm-hmm. missed their grandkids. They mm-hmm. talk about that. One of them said, you know, we've taken each of our three grandkids on a trip one at a time. Mm-hmm. And she said, and I love this term, she said, my husband and I call it legacy travel. Mm-hmm. And it it just resonates as self-defining the moment you hear it. Because, you know, the, the baby boomer generation is nudging sort of, you know, the, 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 the departure lounge. <laughs> and, right? And so people get thinking, what are you going to be leaving behind? What are you going to leave mm-hmm. for your kids, your grandkids? I would say that for grandparents, legacy travel 
is something they can give to their kids or their grandkids. Riley, he, you know, he was sarcastic. He was funny. He was everything you would think a 10 year old would be, including very polite to other people <laughs> and, and wanting more smoothies. And I think his mom and dad would want me to let him have, but it wasn't <laughs> me. It was the, the, the train crew, the entire experience, lots of days on the train. He'd look out the observation deck. He'd look out and he'd turn to me and he'd say things like he'd, he'd see an old farm home that had been deserted for maybe 30 years. And he'd say, that's sad. What do you think happened? Mm -hmm. And we'd talk that, you know, one day that was built and the walls were up and people stood in front of us and we built a home we hope will last forever. And they were so proud of it. Now it's been dilapidated. Did mm -hmm. they run out of money, run out of family? What did they do? Or he'd turn to me and he'd just, after a couple of days, he'd say, you're, you're not as easy to travel with as I thought you'd be. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, so the honesty was, of a 10-year-old. <laughs> oh, the honesty. And that would come up time and again. Uh, I, you know, I tell you, there, there's toward the end and we're staying uh, at a, a lodge at a lake in the Rockies. We're out for a hike. And we start jostling and I want to keep on going another five minutes. And he said, no. And I said, well, just go up to that little bridge over the creek. He said, you said that five minutes ago. And we're jostling and then we start to race and he trips and he falls. And he really, he yelps. He really bashes his knee. Oh. And he turns over and there's, there's dirt in it. There's sticks in it. There's blood going everywhere. Oh, no. And I look at him and he looks at me and he says, I only came because my dad made me. <laughs> So, you know, we, we get back, go into silent mode. I'm sulking. We get back. I'm like, you know, wetting towels in the room, mopping up blood with towels that I don't own. And I'm making a mess and try to get some bandages and all of this stuff. And finally, you know, I realized this. Somebody had to break the silence and I wasn't big enough to do it. Finally, he looks at me and he says, you know, I only said that because I was hurt. Oh, so many beautiful moments. I really think traveling amplifies those moments. And that sounds like a very, very special trip. So I hope that you have enjoyed episode 316 of the Thoughtful Travel podcast. I really enjoyed putting these stories together. They felt special and delightful. So thanks so much to my guests. I first up chatted with Rupert Gray. You can find out more about Rupert at rupertgray.co.uk. And I must make special mention of a movie that was made of Rupert and his wife's trip across India uh, relatively recently. It's called Romantic Road and they shipped their old rolls down to drive across India and it's just, a, I watched it on the weekend and it's just delightful. Uh, and you can find out more about where you could watch that. I believe it's on Netflix in some countries, but I had to watch it off, um, like hiring it from YouTube. Uh, but you can look it up at romanticroadmove.com. Next, I chatted with Christiane Martinus of Sun Trails, who runs tours through Morocco, and you can find out more at sun-trails.com. Next, I had four guests this episode. It was uh, an uh, episode of Riches. Uh, next, I chatted with Peter Baines from Hands Across the Water, and you can find out more about uh, the fabulous rides they do in Thailand at handsacrossthewater.org.au. And last but definitely not least, I chatted with Rick Antonson. More about Rick at rickantonson.com. And he did refer to his new book, Train Beyond the Mountains. I'll leave a link to that as well. Don't forget to come and join our Facebook group or LinkedIn group for Thoughtful Travellers or both if you want. I'll leave the links in the show notes. And all of these links and more will be in the show notes at notaballerina.com slash 316. And as this is, of course, the first episode of 2024, a very happy new year to everyone. And I hope that 2024 brings you all of the delightful travels that you're looking for, as long as they're thoughtful ones. As always, thank you so much much for listening. This has been another episode of the Thoughtful Travel Podcast. Show notes and other information are at notaballerina.com slash podcast. Join me again soon for another chat about why we travel. Bye for now.